Well, hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. I'm really excited to have my good friend Eric Thayer in the house. How are you doing, Eric? Good. Good to be here. Yeah, you sound good on this with these beautiful Rode microphones. I got to uh, give a couple quick shout outs before we start to uh, Adorama, which is where we're hosting this event. Uh, this is a live stream, so uh, hopefully some people are... Hello, everybody from around the world. Oh, P.F. Bentley, your uh, former professor at Brooks Institute, is... Uh, Watching live from Hawaii, so hello, PF. Hello, PF. And shout out to PF. Yes, to PF. He he gave me some uh, talking points, so we'll we'll talk about a few things. Uh, uh -oh. Mexico, he says, and uh, Vegas. So we won't we'll, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit. But um, anyways, we're here at Adorama, uh, in their event space. Uh, if you're interested in seeing more of what they host, and including our events and our monthly meetups, you can go to adorama.com/events. Um, additionally, I want to give a thank you to Tenba Bags, make great bags, Canon Professional Services, um, great organization, as well as Rode Microphones for um, helping support what we're doing here, sharing the work of awesome photographers like yourself. I always use Rode Microphones for all the podcasts that I'm doing. So. Oh yeah, which is, is which the is the first one. one. Yeah, so. <laughs> well, they're great. You'll hear, you'll hear after the fact how great they are. It sounds great in here. Um, Okay, so um, let's ch chat a little bit. I, cool. I, I want to, you and I know each other from, it's 10 years back now. Yeah. We met at the Eddie Adams Workshop. We did. We were both students. We were students. And yeah. now we, we've been uh, producers, so it's kind of mm -hmm. like we're coming full circle and we're, we're coming back. It took us 10 years, I guess. It took us 10 years, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we're getting old, right? <laughs> um, You're getting old, not me. Yeah. Well, so Eddie Adams Workshop. We're there. We're students. What was your deal? Because you you started in this business a little bit later than me, in life. I did. I I um did some stuff before, and then I went back to school uh, for photography, and I uh, was going to Brooks Institute, and then got in. I think my second year, which was when you were a student also. Uh huh. When um, I when I was a student, right? Yeah. yeah. I was at OU. You were at Brooks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what was it like being at uh, Brooks Institute? I mean, West Coast, I hear it's a pretty neat program. It was a lot of fun. It was yeah. a lot of fun because it was such a good location and the instructors were all really good. I mean, I had um, P.F. Bentley and some other guy, Joe Gozen and mm -hmm. Greg Cooper and Paul Myers and some of those guys. Yeah. And they were all really, really good to work with. I learned a lot from P.F. Were you um, originally from California area? I was, yeah. I grew up in L.A. And in I LA. Never, really, never really left until I moved to New York. So. Okay. And so what, what was it that got you? I, I kind of want to go into your background before we start diving into some of your work. Uh, you can already see behind me there's a little bit. You've done some work in Boston. Um, you've, you've done a lot of political work, uh, the, the Obama campaign, and, and all those elections in the last eight, eight to ten years, I guess you could say, you've covered. Okay. Uh, you've left... New York City, where you've been living, to go out to Iowa um, and literally live out there, and worked with some people like Keith Bedford and those and those guys um, covering the campaign trail. Um, but I want to go a little bit into your past and and sort of understand when and why you got into photography and and what led you to the point where you're at today. So um, lay it on me. I was a writer. I, that's what I went to college for the first time, oh. and uh, I sort of um, was doing that and dropped out of school and, you know, kind of was going and I was bartending and then kind of fell into a, a newspaper job at this little local newspaper in northern county of Los Angeles. Uh -huh. And uh, while I was doing that, I was just kind of out with photographers. Like, I was roommates with one of the photographers, and those guys, like, they taught me everything. They taught me, you know. Really? Everything about photography. Like, I didn't know anything about photography. And I, I used to just follow them around, like, brush fires and spot news. and Really? The photo editor hated me why you just because i was a, you know like i'm a writer who's out there running around with a point and shoot camera oh, right, like yeah. pretending to be a photographer yeah. so obviously you know yeah he was like what's this guy doing and so you went you said you went to school for for writing at first or yeah, yeah i was okay. an english major and uh, yeah, I studied english and studied english and yeah some other do you do much writing now with your your photography at all no i really don't do it much anymore i probably should i mean i write a little on the side but i don't no. Not too much. What about blogging? I don't know. I feel like every time I like sit down and think I have something to say, I really don't. 
like it after it's, I write it. So. Blogging's hard. <laughs> it is hard. It, it's um, I, I, th- I unless it's, you're talking about shoes, and then it's I, shoes or food, right? Those are the <laughs> food. Those are the big blogs that everybody talks about. Right. Well, are you big into? Do you have a big shoe thing? I don't. No, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Just checking. Um, I, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons why we sort of started Photo Brigade was to encourage blogging and uh, mm-hmm. getting people, because freelancers out there, you know, five years ago when we started, it, it was, you know, a lot of people were on staff. There's a lot of these freelancers and they weren't really utilizing, I, I think, the social media blogging and all that kind of stuff to the capacity that they should have been. Right. And the idea behind what we did was, you know, started a Facebook group where we could start featuring that work, sharing links to different people's blogs, and then it turned into our own blog featuring featuring these sort of things. So, um, and, but you have been, you have blogged. You, you do have a blog. You have blogged. You just, does it seem like in the last, I don't know, couple of years that it's become less of a thing for you? Do you feel like you need to blog? Do you feel like you're missing out by not blogging? It just gets hard. I guess, you know, you're working and you kind of get burned out. Like you get, I think you get to a point where in your career, when you start out, you're excited to do everything and you're excited about every aspect of the business and you want to shoot all the time. You always have a camera with you and you're always just so excited about it. Right. And then you kind of hit a point where, you know, your career sort of like gets going and you, you know, you, you sort of are doing it all the time and it becomes more like a job sometimes. Right. And so I guess sometimes it's, you know, I probably should. I probably should blog more and probably should. We all should. Really should. But it's funny. Since I've started Photo Brigade, my own blog, my own personal blog has really suffered. I I do maybe like one every six months at this point. It used to be that I would try to do one a week or a couple of months, a couple per month. Um, But, uh, you know, I've, I've been really working on the Photo Brigade to get this stuff going. Um, Okay. um, So I was going to maybe go through a a few of your photos. I don't think maybe we should start on the most recent. Um, So we were talking about your former professor, P.F. Bentley, who's who's watching us from uh, Hawaii. (laughs) I was just chatting with him yesterday and, and, uh, you know, he seems to be living the life, you know, out in out in paradise. I know you were in Maui recently. Yeah. And I've got a lot of business going on in Maui also, which we'll talk about later. But he he mentioned to me to, to bring up Mexico in Vegas. He said, uh, so what, tell me a little bit about what he's talking about, because I don't know. Well, I was, I was um, interning and then freelancing at the local paper in Ventura, where, where Brooks campus was. And, uh, you know, I was perfectly happy doing that. And um, PF was sponsoring this trip to Vegas where he was sending, you know, he was advising like eight of us to go to Vegas for two months and like live in Vegas. Oh, really? And do a project, yeah. Oh, so cool. I asked to go on the trip because I didn't have a class. Well, actually, it was either take video or go on this trip, and I figured Vegas would be more fun than taking a video class. I was never really into video. So. Really never into video. Uh, Have you gotten into it since? No, nah, not really. Not really? You just like your stills and your words, <laughs> which you don't use anymore. You only use your, your pictures now. That's right. Um, so anyway, he, he sent us on this trip to Vegas, and, and we all went and lived in Vegas for a while. And then we had another one. He did a second trip where we went to, uh, we all lived down on the uh, the uh, U.S.-Mexico border uh-huh. for another two months. And the PF is good at like, or he, you know, is good at like finding stories and finding what's going to be the next big story. And so both of these things, when he sent us there, were like right on the cusp of becoming big news. And, uh-huh. was right and we, should, big we should backtrack and talk a little bit about PF. He, he was formerly a Time Magazine correspondent. I believe at the White House, right, yeah. for the um, Clinton and Bush years, or Super part of both, ass, or something like that. Yeah, yeah really, really, really good yeah, at what he, he does. Yeah. And then he took a job teaching at Brooks, mm-hmm. you know, uh, in the early 2000s, I guess it was, right, or all late the, 90s. All early. the behind the scenes Clinton stuff that you see, like, it's all, you know, he sort of was. There's sort of this that. one yeah. really famous one of uh, uh, Bill and Hillary's lap. In a campaign office, like yeah, just something you don't see anymore, especially these guys before they were who they were. Yeah, he always talked about access and like if you know the big, the hardest part was always getting into the room. That was what I was always saying. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. Once yeah. you're in, you're in. It's one of those situations. See, I paid attention, PF. Ah, oh, well, there you go. Um, so, do you think that his? You've done a lot of. I, I, we're going to get into your work, I know. But uh, do you think that uh, he had a lot to do with the sort of where you've gone in this industry, you know, because yeah. you cover a lot of politics. That's one of the main things you cover. I never thought I'd cover politics. It was a weird thing. But actually, the reason I moved to New York was because of PF. Oh, really? Yeah, I went into his office, and I, like, had 
applied for an internship and like put everything into that internship Uh and like didn't get it. And so I went into his office and I'm like, well, I'm going to move to San Francisco. He's like, what the hell are you going to move to San Francisco for? There's no work. Go to New York. And I was uh-huh. like, all right, cool. So, 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 you, so when did you come here, was it? Um, April 2006. 2006. Okay, so that was about one year after I got here. I came yeah. here in 2005 interning mm-hmm. and sort of went freelance. Um, and you live in Brooklyn, right? Yeah. Always have lived in Brooklyn. No, I lived in the city. I was... On the Upper West Side. I remember we lived a block apart. Oh, remember yeah. That? Yeah. You li- That's right. Yeah. Very cool. See, I, I'm, everything's coming back. I mean, we've been here for a decade now, so it's like kind of crazy to think. Yeah, well, not right? a decade, but almost a almost decade. Almost a decade. Eight years it's been for me. So let's get into some of the photos that you took uh, with PF. So these are this is this is going back into time when you were a student. <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure that uh, your, your skill level has risen since then. Let's Can hope. you tell me a little bit about this little picture series, a little series of eight? Uh, I found this little church in Vegas. It was the first time I'd ever done a picture story on anything. Uh huh. And um, so I found this woman, and she ran this little church, and it took care of all the people in the neighborhood in, like, the worst part of Vegas. And that was what PF kind of pushed us to do was to get off the strip and, like, go do all these other, you know, uh-huh. find these other parts of places that weren't as glamorous. And, right. Know, and find real And stories. so what's happening here? I mean, this guy looks messed up. Is this... Yeah, it was it was a pretty tough place. She took care of a lot of people who were like, you know, homeless and heroin addicts. And, oh wow, you know, it was bad, really bad. Yeah. Did you feel like unsafe at all doing anything like no? No, they were all really great. Yeah, yeah. And um, so this ended up. Uh, what did you do with this project? Was it just like, hey, I turned it in, got an A or something like that? Nothing's ever. Well, I only got a B because PF never gave A's. But... Whoa, whoa, PF, not fair. I remember one time I I got like a D on a project that I killed when I was in college. And the reason why was because I submitted it on the CD-ROM in the wrong format or something like that. I'm like, a D? So it's all right. And PF would have thrown made that out, the, out of the classroom. Would he? Yeah, yeah he probably yeah. would have. <laughs> um, great. So this is, this is uh, oops, what you did there. And then also we have a, a border story as well. Yeah, he sent us down to the border. And actually, this is I've done a lot of work on the border since then. Maybe that's and what we'll do. We'll start here, and then we'll go into your border work so you can see how things have progressed. And this was, this was like the first part of that. I never really, you know, paid much attention to the border uh-huh. other than, you know, going down on surf trips with my friends in like Baja. Surf trips. But, like, at this point, we, you know, we were in, down there in Nogales and living in Nogales. And kind of this is when Arizona was, like, the hot spot. You know, this is when all of the immigration stuff was happening there. So right. we were kind of all in the middle of it. Right. And uh, so since since then, I mean, these pictures are, are very nice, but since then, I got to say, you've developed a real style of your own. Uh, so so we're going to fast forward now, and we'll go back in between and, and, and touch on some, some of the other things you've done. But we're going to fast forward now to the project that you've been doing here. Where's the border? Here it is. And um, <clears throat> so since, since then, you've covered... All these presidential campaigns, you've you've uh, you've covered Ferguson, uh, the big you know the shooting and all those riots that have happened there, and many many other stories in between freelancing and whatnot. So go ahead and, and how who are you covering this for? What are, what's the deal with the border story? Uh, I did this for Reuters. I did this in a few different trips, um, and my, my whole plan was to cover, like travel the entire border, uh-huh. all you know two thousand plus miles of it. And I did it basically in two trips mm-hmm. with a couple, you know, trips down between. Mm-hmm. And the first part I did from the fence all the way out in San Diego, all the way to El Paso. And uh-huh. the second part I did Juarez down to basically Brownsville in the end of it. Uh-huh. So this is just part of that. And I, I don't know, a lot of people were doing a lot of different border, you know, stories at that time. And I just sort of wanted to kind of show the whole thing and. Kind of from your from your point of view, I yeah. mean, everybody's got a different different angle. A lot of a lot of different photographers cover the same story, and you do that a lot. You yeah. like the campaigns and the riots and stuff. You you kind of you tend to work in packs, and mm-hmm. and while you're still there covering the same thing, maybe there's a little bit of like uh, friendly competition or whatever. But you're all covering it in your own way. Definitely. Everyone has their own vision, their own you know sense of style, and and uh, I think that that's important. Yeah, we're all working together and helping each other out too, right. which is key for this yeah yeah so ha- can you tell me a little bit about the difficulties covering a, a project like this is it did you find it hard at all or did you just kind of go in and make it work no i mean you have to you know 
depending on where you go, it can be dangerous or it can be, you know, hard. It's hard to find people to shoot and it's hard, you know, especially something that big. Um, but people were great. People were always nice. People were, you know, friendly. Right. There are definitely challenges to covering all this stuff. But, uh-huh. You know, you work your way around it. Somehow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, did you, did you, you worked from the, the Mexico side as well? Mm-hmm. And did you find it more difficult on the Mexico side or on the U.S. side? It depends on where it was and, you know, when during the project it was because there was a lot of drug violence going on at that time. So it was also hard to kind of work in Mexico. Uh huh. But and sometimes it was harder on the U.S. side because people are very suspicious of photography for some reason. Right. Do you speak Spanish? A little bit. Yeah. You know. Same here. Yeah. I'm probably so, like very low intermediate. Yeah. But I'm probably below that. Actually. I'm below that. <laughs> Soy un periodista. <laughs> <laughs> Just, I just smile and say, see, yeah. See, yes, yes. That's what I find, though, is is uh, getting, like, when I went to Cuba. Have you, have you been to Cuba recently? No, I haven't been to Cuba. you got to get to Cuba. That seems like a place you'd love to shoot. A lot of people are going down to Cuba now. But when I went to Cuba, I didn't speak, you know, hardly any uh, Spanish. And I find that just a uh, great smile and, you know, inviting eyes really does, does a lot. Then, you know, some people can feel like they're sneaking around. But if you're just up front with people and happy, likely they'll respond in a happy way. Right? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, oh, that's a great shot. From the car window shot? Or yeah. through was, a car window I shot? I was in Juarez and with my fixer. and he was Prostitution going on? Yeah, there was a little bit of that stuff going on. A <laughs> little bit of this, a little bit of that, yeah. Um, awesome. These are great photos. Thanks. And so we, sh- we should also mention that uh, some people are listening only on uh, audio so if anybody wants to actually see the photos that we're putting out right now you can go to uh, our youtube page photo brigade and also uh the photo brigade.com slash live has all of our previous events in this event as well so check us out for sure uh, don't miss out on some of these amazing photos um do you do you foresee your this project continuing this uh border project yeah definitely i need to get back down there and i mean there's always those things that you you know sort of spend your career working on that sort of keep drawing you back and the border is kind of one of those things that's one of those things for you yeah yeah and i mean it's not you know i've I've like i never really covered it like some of this is drug violence stuff but like there were guys down there who were like doing really really hardcore like badass work like with this kind of stuff oh wow yeah i got mad respect for those guys yeah because i just sort of touched along the edge of it in the project that i was doing yeah but you know that's that's another thing that I want to talk about. I mean, I, I know that Dominic you, Bracco and like Shaul and those guys. Right. right. They're just some people that really uh, risk their lives to cover things like this drug violence in Mexico or conflicts overseas. And, mm-hmm. you know, we've had mutual friends that have gotten themselves killed, unfortunately, mm-hmm. doing these types of things. What's your sort of take on that? I mean, I know, obviously, Ferguson ended up getting tense there's obviously some people got shot recently uh police officers um in terms of like what is it worth to you to risk your life to make a photo or is it not you know what's the what's the line for for eric there i mean it's i had always thought of myself as like wanting to become a war photographer like that's sort of what everybody you know (laughs) sort of strives to be everybody watches then a war photographer right wants to be a war photographer but I don't know. I mean, I never really, I always kind of waited for the right opportunity to present itself Uh to go. And whether it was just other projects I was working on or other things or life or whatever, I never really like took that next jump into it, you know, and I've definitely been in a lot of like, you know, crazy dangerous situations or whatever, but nothing where I've been into a war. Right. Do you, do you foresee yourself ever doing that? Or do you think you, you kind of stay away, shy away from that sort of... No, I mean, I don't shy away from the, like, the violence part of it or the danger part of it. I think it's more of the, like, it's, it's hard to do it as a freelancer because it's very expensive. And if nobody's backing you, you know, as a freelancer, you're on your own. And if something happens to you, you're, you know... And I, I feel like a lot of people jump into that without really thinking about it uh-huh. without you know training and without doing the things that because there are proper training that you can go through like mm-hmm. uh forget what it's called the, but the what is it the bronx documentary center i think or risk. something so, risk yeah risk training where it's like really like badass sort of like this is the crap that could happen to you you know learn how to you know 
bandage someone up or put a tourniquet on someone's arm if it gets blown off or CPR and, and then all that kind of thing. Yeah, even the most basic first aid, you know, is, I mean, just something. Yeah. It's, it's funny to think. I remember when I was younger in Ohio, I took some sort of CPR training class. And I'm realizing, holy cow, that's now like 15, 20 years ago. And I, I don't know what I would do if something happened in front of me. Yeah. Um, like, are you CPR trained or anything? Yeah. You are. Okay. So you would know what to do. Well, that's good. See, I don't. That's why, I mean, I should. I'm going to. It's a pact. 2015, before the year's out, <laughs> I'm going to take a class. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so. I think I'll put like a link up or something about that risk training for people because that is a really important note. Yeah, there are some really good training courses out there that you can There's take. some here in New York. I'm not sure where, where else there yeah, are. there's some other ones. I'll, yeah. I'll send you some links of some Yeah, cool. Stuff, yeah. yeah, we'll put them up. Um, and uh, you, t- you have a lot of photos from this, uh, this story, don't you? Quite a few. Um, all right. So let's, let's uh, move on to one of your next projects here. Great. Okay. So, oh, actually, no, let's, let's talk a little bit about business as, as we continue looking at some of the photos. Um, so you mentioned we're freelancers. Yeah. You've always been a freelancer. Mm -hmm. I've always been a freelancer and we've been it for about the same amount of time. A lot of our friends, I don't know what it was like growing up, not growing up, but, um, going to school at Brooks, what the expectations of students were coming out of that school. I know that OU, a lot of people, like the, the goal was to get some sort of staff job right out of college. And some people did. I never did. I did an internship and just decided to go freelance. For me, I feel that it was the best decision that I could have ever made because there's, you know, there's no real stability with uh, uh, staffing anymore. Yeah, I mean, you know, 10, 15 years ago, newspaper jobs were the thing to have. And that was, you know... That was the way to go, and that was the way I thought I was going to go, too. And then I sort of, you know, like I said, I didn't get the right internship at the right newspaper, and sort of it changed the direction of my career right. dramatically. I yeah. mean, I, who knows where I'd be now if I had gotten that internship or, uh-huh. you know, if I had ended up in a newspaper at a staff job. And I, I don't know, I just wanted the freedom to do this. I wanted the freedom to do, you know, whatever I wanted to do whenever I wanted, whenever I wanted to do it, I guess. And it was, you know. I enjoy this part of it. I enjoy the, you know, I've gotten used to it. Right. And um, the business aspect, like, has it over the years, like, a lot of people want to get into freelance, but they they are worried about jumping into it. Mm -hmm. My advice always to them, I don't know if it's the same with you, and I'd love you to share your advice, is that the sooner you can get started, the better. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're just sitting there and, and, uh, you know, wishy-washy about doing it or leaving your job or starting it, that's every minute you're not working for yourself, you're not building your own brand, you're not uh, producing work that you can eventually sell and create revenue from, and you're not making connections which lead to other, um, you know, clients. Right. And so ha- have you found, like, what's the, what, how's it been for you in, in terms of business? Are you, how, are you making, how are you making it by? Because editorial work is, doesn't pay very much. And as you said, freelancing, doing these types of jobs, you know, they're expensive. Yeah. So how have you made it editorially? Are you taking commercial work and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I didn't. I, for a long time, I just did. Well, when I first got to New York, I, I wasn't able to make it just as a freelancer. So I took a day job and I was working at Contact Press Images just in the office, you know, doing office stuff. Mm. Which was a great job. I love that place a lot. Our first podcast was with uh, David Burnett. Yeah. Our video podcast, I should say. Yeah, to work you know, with him. I was in this office surrounded by 30 years of some of the best photojournalism in the world. And you're just <laughs> great like inspiration, day, yeah. You're just like, and so I did that for a long time. And then I was able to like jump off from that and start freelancing full time. But you know, I feel like I've done that for a while now. And I feel like now I'm at a point in my career where... You know, you want more. You want to move on from that. You want to, like, you know, you can make it definitely as a freelancer, but, like, you you can't live forever on that. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no real, you know, there's no real long-term editorial freelancer plan. So you kind of have to supplement with other things. And I've been doing more commercial and corporate stuff. And For the most part, as a freelance editorial photographer, you have to be working all the time to cover your cost of doing business. Yeah, and, and it burns and you out. If you're, you know, if you're working that much and doing that much, it burns you out, especially if you're covering heavy, heavy news. 
you can only do that for so long before it makes you crazy, you know, and you you kind of have to take a step back. And Right, right. Or doing, you know, here in New York, it's tough as a freelancer because you're constantly fighting for position or fighting for, you know, this much space behind a police barricade and fighting with the police and fighting, <laughs> you know, it's you're, you're like it, it, it grinds down and it, it wears you out. And so, you know, to, to keep that passion for this going, you kind of have to find other things to like, you know, make your money so that you can do the things. What you sort of doing. things are those for you? I've just been doing a lot more corporate work now and I'm kind of, you know, trying to maybe explore other avenues like commercial work and right. some of that, you know. I know we've worked with each other mm -hmm. and well, you know, when I can't handle something, I'll pass it on your way. Yeah, and that's kind of how the freelance community here is in Definitely. New York City, um, which is really nice. Uh, we came in at a time when I think it was sort of before editorial assignments kind of went to shit. Uh, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was freelancing in the beginning after my internship at the Times, it was I was covering in the morning a, a job for the Times and then a job for Bloomberg in the afternoon and then in the evening a, a corporate gig, you know, whatever. And I was actually doing well and, and building them in like that. Yeah. And nowadays it's just, you know, it's rarely anything like that. So, I mean, for myself, I've supplemented my income by doing what you've done is mm -hmm. taking all sorts of other types of jobs and figuring out different res revenue streams um, which is really good and, and it's hard too because you know editors change and things change and you know you have to develop whole you know new relationships with new editors and, right you know, so it's, well that it's a it's a blessing and a curse if you and, and if you look at it in the in the sense that if you're only working for one I know a lot of friends of mine who only will work for the New York Times or one particular outlet and they're only making X amount per day, which is, yeah. you know, editorially quite low. Um, and then those editors move on to different places and they're still staying at this one publication. They have right. to, you know, figure out who the new editors are and it becomes this whole thing to do. But if you look at it, like, there are so many editors, friends of mine, when I was an intern and, and freelancing for the Times that I've been friends with, whether it's in person, on Facebook, whatever, but they they do, they move on. Sometimes they move to a different desk at the same paper. Sometimes they move on to a different magazine or newspaper. Or a couple of my friends have become director of photographies at some of the biggest you know publications um, out there. You know, like Brad Smith was an editor at, at uh, New York Times. Now he's director of photography at Sports Illustrated. Um, Jack Van Anthrop was an editor at the Times. And then he was a director of photography at Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. So all those, and, and same goes with a friend of mine, Brent Murray. Um, now he's over at Bloomberg uh, Digital doing all sorts of stuff. I'm not sure if his title is director of photography, though. But, um, you know, have you found that that has been a good thing for you as well? Like uh, photo editors moving to different places? Have, have you found your business blossoming a bit? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, it's, sometimes it's challenging because some people leave the business or do other things, but some people move on to different parts of the business yeah. and you know and some people even move into like more corporate uh, yeah. or more like advertising or become PR type type people yeah. so um, so let's uh, jump into some more photography and we'll, we'll continue to talk some business so let's move on to Ferguson this is uh, something that's more recent obviously um, so let's break break it down for me what happened everybody knows what happened but tell, tell us uh, you know Ferguson was I mean, everybody knows what happened in Ferguson, it, but it was, you know, we were there, there was a small group of us there, and I don't know, it was a, uh, it was a crazy story to cover, for sure. So it was, my, well, Michael Brown got, was the name of the, the, the right. young man that got killed, yeah, he, and there's he all these riots, the was shot and, by a police officer, right. hands up, don't shoot, and right. this became like a whole right. protest thing. Um, yeah, we were there for, you know, there was a big group of us there, were two weeks the first time, and two weeks the second time, you know. I mean, there were a lot of local people there too, and there were people there who were lo there longer than us. And, right. You know, there was, but like the, the there's a group of us who kind of travel together and like do yeah. a lot of this stuff together. And, yeah. You did the pack thing. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And like, you, and you do that same sort of thing with po politics as well, or yeah, or? yeah. It's I mean, that's what's cool about this is that you get to go and work with your best friends and like do you know, every day you're with your best friends and they're looking out for you and you're looking out for them, especially in situations like this that were super dangerous and. So, yeah, so that was another thing, is that this was really a dangerous situation. Yeah. I remember you were out with, I think, Lucas Jackson, yeah. and I'm not sure who else was Joshua with Lott Joshua Lott, there. of course, which yeah. we're going to talk about, Instagram and your Instagram. And um, 
and and the danger that was being I remember Lucas constantly on Facebook don't be stupid and come out here without being aware that you could get shot or hurt or injured or something yeah because this wasn't this wasn't a protest I mean this was kind of a legit war zone I mean not that I've been to a war zone but you know this is sort of it was the, a war zone I mean the, the closest thing I could think of there was a lot of gunfire and there was a lot of like super super dangerous situations and, uh-huh Definitely. Would you say that this is one of the more dangerous situations you've had yourself in? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and what? Sure. So, what did you do to protect protect yourself? Like, I mean, obviously being in the pack so that you, your friends can help you. I mean, you 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 know you wear body armor and you wear helmets and you do all that stuff to keep yourself protected. But you also like, you know, for us, we we found somebody who we were gonna like stick to. You know, like for me, it was me and Lucas and uh-huh. me and Joshua or me and Aaron. Like we would always. You know, we'd always find each other and we'd be like, all right, as long as I know where you are and you are know, know where I am, we're good. Mm-hmm. And so you sort of do that and you sort of find your people and you're always keeping aware of where they are too, just to kind of watch out for each other. Did you have gas masks and stuff? Yeah, we had gas masks. I wish I had a photo of you in full gear. That'd be great. <laughs> you and Lucas. I'm sure they exist somewhere. It's probably out there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe I'll get you to send me one and I'll post it somewhere. Um is this this is uh, just just a random uh, case file? It was um yeah it was the the guy who did the autopsy the, the newspaper I was working for did a uh, that's crazy interview. one two three four five shots yeah. Incre- incredible um, so when the, the recently the it kind of broiled up again there was the uh, officer that ended up getting shot in the face I believe yeah. did you end up going back for that no I almost went back but I didn't end up going back for that. This is one of the, your, like, this is like one of the shots from the, this, you know, right? This is kind of ran in a lot of places and you've been, so did you, like, when you were shooting these things, do you know, like, oh crap, like, this is where I'm making the best shot or? No, I mean, you just kind of go out and shoot how you shoot and you're just, you know. See what happens when you look, mm-hmm. look back at it. Some days you have good days and some days you have better days, you know? Right. And you're, you're a cannon shooter, right? Yeah. Okay. I think you have the same kind of kit that I, that I shoot with. which is like a 5D2 and a, and a bunch of prime lenses, right? Yeah. You're a prime shooter. No, well, I, I just got the new 24-70, which uh-huh. is really nice. Is it? So, yeah. Was it 2.8? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. So a lot of this stuff I was shooting with like a, that and a, a 35-1.4. Right. And a, and a 70-200 mostly. Oh, okay. So you actually are only using one prime lens at this point, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the 35. I, yeah, for I mean, for all the campaign stuff, I was using the 24 and the 50, like mm-hmm. primarily. That's really what I was shooting most with, and then, and then that gets kind of stale. So you got to kind of, you know, mix it up a little bit. Yeah. So that's what I've been trying to do is kind of push. You know. The closest thing I ever came to shooting a riot was when I was a intern at the Columbus Dispatch in Ohio, and <laughs> stupid the. Uh, the, the, the OSU bull, Bulldogs, OSU uh, Buckeyes, you know, beat Michigan to go undefeated. So all the students decided to riot and burn couches and break into the bookstores and everything like that. And I remember this, you know, I was just a young, eager student at the time. And they came and tried to take my camera from me, rip my flash off. Luckily, I, you know, got away and was about to use my camera as a weapon. Have you ever been in a kind of instance where, I mean, this is obviously night and day compared to what I covered and what you covered, a bunch of stupid students versus this, you know, crazy yeah, I mean, protest. Yeah, there's been, you know, not even just here, like in Haiti, you know, people come at you there sometimes and mm-hmm. people in, you know, people just don't want their picture taken sometimes. People yeah. Especially in situations like this where you have people looting and you have people who, exactly. you know. Well, that's what, that was my problem. I was, I think, 18, 19 years old and looked like a college student. And then I went up to the college student that was breaking into the thing and asked for his name for the paper. Uh, <laughs> so I learned my lesson. Info, yeah. I learned my lesson, right? Um, yeah. Wow. It's got to be kind of like creepy just seeing these masked people in the in the. I don't know. There's something, there's something very nefarious about all of this. I don't know. I mean, yes and no. I mean, it was all part of, kind of part of the, the thing. You know, you also have the police on the other side with their masks. So That's it's true. All, That's true. It's Absolutely this, right. Yeah. You make a good point. It's a great contrast that you, that you make. You're right. Obviously, from this to this. Because that's pretty scary looking, too. I wouldn't want to see these guys running at me like this. Hmm. But, you know, for the most part, everybody was great. Like, we didn't really have a lot of bad interactions with people the protesters or the police you know well a few people did yeah i mean there were definitely some bad 
police and there were some bad protesters. But, you know, I would say 90% on both sides were great to work with, you know. Okay. That's good. And like the other 10% were just happened to be the ones. Wasn't that, it uh, Scott Olson? That arrested. was part of the 10%. They that almost was part arrested of me that day, too. Oh, really? Yeah, a lot of us almost got arrested that day. They just, for some reason, they just had it in for the press, and they were like, all right, you guys, you guys are done. Today. You guys are making us look bad. We're taking you yeah, out of here. Yeah, it's, we're, we're done Situation. with you, yeah. That's, and, and, and this looks like it's probably like early morning now, right? So you, you were staying up all through the night, mm-hmm. getting any sleep while you were yeah, here? Yeah, a few hours. A few hours here and there. Yeah, but. Scott Olson, though, stayed, he stayed up all night. A few of us went and slept for a couple hours. Huh. And you stayed at a, a hotel somewhere nearby? Yeah, yeah. We all stayed at pretty much the same hotel. It was all this hotels. located. All of it was happening kind of in one area, So mm-hmm. pretty much. It wasn't like you had to find go across town and find these different things. No, it was all right there in one spot. So Season this is like a, <laughs> Nice. This is like a, maybe a mile away from where everything was burning, too. So it kind of was all in the same right. area. So it was easy. And, they, easy and, and there was I know here in New York, they kind of will keep press back for, for certain, in certain situations, but they didn't, they really didn't give you, except for that one day, they let you kind of just get right in there and, or where they were trying to push you back. Yeah. I mean, there were times when they, you know, told us to get back or they told us where we were going to be, but it never, it never got to the point where they enforced that except for a couple instances. Uh huh. What would happen is the police would push really hard and then they would just kind of fall back. Uh huh. Like the next day they would fall back, and then the next day they'd be really, really, you know, they'd go crazy, and then the next day they'd fall back. And then the National Guard came out. I forgot about yeah, that. The National Guard was there. Yeah. It got pretty tense. Yeah. I mean, these guys were probably just like, "Oh, come on, you know, like, get it over with, and let's get onto real, real work." I would imagine. Yeah. Because there's some. It's sad though. It's a sad thing that this is happening in our in our country, and and there's a lot of scrutiny now being put on police officers, as there should. Uh, there shouldn't be you know things like this happening. Um, do you feel that? Uh, do you feel that there's being too much scrutiny being now put on? Having kind of witnessed all of this, sort of seeing both sides being in term, you know, within that turmoil. I mean, it's tough because you're there in the middle of it, and you don't really want to form an opinion either way that you know that's very strong. Because right. if you do, then you can't do your job correctly. Right. You know, but I don't know. I mean, I think that there definitely needs to be a dialogue about the way policing is done in this country. Uh huh. You know, just from, but I think it goes deeper than that. And I think, you know, it has to do with a lot of other things. And it's a, it's more socioeconomic than anything else. And right. You know, there's a lot of issues in this country that need to be addressed. But, you know, I mean, that's, that's kind of a bigger, that's right. for smarter people than me to figure out, actually. So, uh-huh. um, I just take the pictures. And so these photos now, I should mention. I think are these these are Instagram mm-hmm. or okay, or, or you're doing a you know meeting format or something. But yeah, so you do a lot. What's really cool about you is you you've embraced Instagram in a big way, um, and we have a, a gallery which we'll go through next of of your Instagram work. And um, I know you mentioned talking with uh, jo- about Josh Lott. I don't know. It's been about a year or two now since you and him had this kind of contest with one oh, another, yeah. <laughs> right? And yeah. I was so like impressed with it and sort of jealous of it, I'll, I'll admit, that um, I wanted to start doing something similar. And I actually had had for about a year did a photo brigade kind mm-hmm. of insta, yeah, insta cage match is what I called it. Maybe we'll bring it back at some point. It's actually, we were doing them every two weeks and it got to be like, oh, you know, kind of hard to deal with um, going through all the entries and getting people to judge it because we had guest judges and everything. Um, but can you talk to me a little bit about um, Instagram and, and your, your thoughts on it in general? I mean, I think it's cool. I love Instagram. I, you know, I, th- I know it's kind of... So it looks like a lot of these photos are... I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, that's right. Uh, it looks like a lot of these photos, like I saw fo- these same photos with your camera camera and then now I'm seeing Instagram photos. So you're shooting with both simultaneously almost. Yeah. I mean, when it first started, I like it, it was a bunch of us on the campaign. Like there was a group of us and we all sort of did it. And, um, you know, it just was kind of a thing and we all just sort of followed each other and didn't really pay that much, you know, pay much attention to it. And then like it sort of like blew up. Instagram just blew up and all of us sort of like got a lot of followers from that. And I don't know, it's, it's, something that I really like didn't take very seriously when it first started. Right. And it was always these pictures that were just like kind of, we'd be traveling and we'd be doing something on the campaign 
and I'd take these off pictures that I wasn't going to shoot with my camera because right. it was like we're, we're on a bus or we're in a plane or we're doing something like that's sort of meaningless. and Right. But and still, it, you can make pretty photos. And, and then I just started doing it and it, you know, and then it became a thing, I guess. Yeah, it sure has become a thing. And then, you know, then I started having to take it more seriously because clients now will look at Instagram and say, well, why didn't you, you know, file that photo? And so now you have to. Now they want these things. It used to be there. I remember there was a point at which the Times hadn't. I was actually in the first the the New York Times when I was an intern. I got to go into a page one meeting and it was the the day they used for the first time a cell phone photo for the A1 on the. New York Times and it was there was a Madrid train bombing if you remember that oh yeah, yeah I remember that and there was some cell phone footage you know of them kind of going through the tunnels and it was this big to do you know like do we do this is this you know something we we should start doing and of course they ended up doing it and obviously Instagram has blown up and now now it seems like the New York Times for instance has their Instagram account you know they have they have five or six of them for their different yeah. departments mm-hmm. have you and I know that you've been become very popular on Instagram because of Instagram featured you, I think, at one point when you and Josh did your your sort of cage match thing, not cage match, your mm-hmm. contest with one another. Um, so you've you've gotten a lot of followers. Uh, do you do you find that are you getting hired to shoot Instagrams these days? Yeah, sometimes. Really? Yeah, it's happened a few. Can you times. give me like an example of of that? I did something for um, the UN Foundation where they hired six of us as you know as Instagram photographers to like cover their event which was really cool actually really super fun yeah. that sounds like fun yeah, i'd love to awesome. just walk around with my cell phone the whole time yeah, yeah how awesome. do you feel about uh, people posting photos on instagram that are from their real camera i think it's fine i mean what instagram has become now is you know it's a it's another platform right you know and it's I don't, do you do you ever use your, yeah once in a while once I mean, in a while yeah i mean i don't i don't see anything wrong with it i think it's i think whatever the best photos are you know should end up being seen however they're seen Mm -hmm. and if you know this is where you want to display your photos then cool i mean it's so this is an example of how you you show the sort of behind the scenes action right so this is on a on a plane with uh what carrie or something this was uh (laughs) that's a while uh, ago paul ryan paul ryan spent some time with paul ryan traveling with him Uh uh-huh and uh, you basically charter out a plane or whatever Mm -hmm. and you just get a seat you were working for reuters at the time right new york times oh new york times okay So what you did is is you kind of do you go to the Times and pitch to them, say, hey, I'm going to be out here. I'd like to work this campaign trail. Or do they reach out to you knowing your background? Sometimes both. With a lot of the early campaign stuff, you kind of have to go and do it on your own. And then it sort of, you know, the Build. momentum builds. Right. And then people will, you know, trust you a little more to do a little bit bigger right. stuff. Right, right. So this is I'm just kind of finishing up. I'm going backwards through your... Uh, your politics gallery, just to, to kind of show these. And look at this. <laughs> so there is a lot of downtime with, with these events yeah, we, that you do. Because, I mean, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're half, you know, flying and traveling half the time. Mm-hmm. And then there's only like an hour or two that the actual event's taking place, right? Or Yeah, we were, he was doing a private event. And so we stopped in Lakeland, Florida and landed at this tiny little airport in the middle of this crazy thunderstorm. And so we're there and he gets off and goes and does his event. And we have three hours waiting on the plane Oh, and the planes just, it wasn't open to the press. And, this now. <laughs> and so we were all bored and we're like, what are we going to do? So we start, you know, somebody brought out the golf clubs and we started playing you know, golf on the airplane. So That's a funny stuff. thing. We should do some sort of post on photo brigade on the things that, that you should bring when you're on these types of, yeah. for the, for the people that don't do it so often, like, yeah. Oh yeah, I should have brought some sort of toy <laughs> to play. Yeah. Or the, the orange. Everybody does the orange thing on the planes, the orange thing. Yeah. With the candidates. It's, I don't know what you're talking about. What are you saying? Orange thing with the candidates. Um, so when you take off, somebody puts an orange in the aisle and, the, and it rolls back. Somebody catches it. I don't know. Just a <laughs> wow. <laughs> that is exciting, Eric. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's it's better when you're there. I guess I guess you have to be there for that one. Right? <laughs> okay. So um, I'm gonna go from the the beginning at the with some of the real photos to kind of show the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, so this is, it's interesting, too. I recently did a podcast with uh, Pete Souza and, you know, how, how, you know, he's using Instagram as well mm-hmm. and how it is such a, a delivery tool for, for images. Um, when you are shooting the Instagram or shooting Instagrams, I mean, you're, you're more shooting them for, for your people, like the people that follow you. 
do you feel like an almost an obligation to be putting out this content for the people that are following you? Do you feel it as a promotional tool? Um, how do you how does it fit in for you at this point? It's hard because you know people have brought that up, and I I feel like I started using Instagram for one reason, and if I change up that reason, then I'm sort of you know then I'm not really being true to you know whatever I started doing this in the first place uh-huh. for, and so I kind of still do it in the same way. I just do what I like and do what you know what I see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I figure if I'm going to be shooting for somebody. It, it probably should be a client, you mm-hmm. know, or if I'm going to like be, you know, you yeah. know what I mean, does that make sense? Yeah. Do you, is there a, is there a message that you try to, uh, this is a well-known photo too of, uh, Paul Ryan, maybe, maybe, yeah, I think it was your photo that I saw this. Um, do you, um, do you have a message that you try to put out through Instagram? It, like any kind of like, is it just sort of like, Hey, follow along my life with me? No, I mean, it's sort of, you know, it's more of, kind of a visual diary than anything else you know it's just kind of same with me that's how i that's how i look at it a a promotional tool really yeah what how do you feel about their terms of service i don't know i mean i feel like i i don't know i don't know too much about i don't understand the question and i'm not (laughs) going to respond to it (laughs) no i've been asked that before i I had to speak about instagram and, and people were pretty adamant about their terms of service and that you know but i don't know i mean i it's certainly important to know what, what you're getting yourself into and, and understand at least what you're doing by doing this. But also, I mean, there's, you know, how many Instagram followers posting how many photos every day? Like if, if somebody's going to archive that and go back through it all and then find my, you know, blurry 3 a.m. picture of a cocktail uh-huh. and like try to use it and make money from it, then good for them. Like, <laughs> yeah, like yes. so be it. Right. All right, cool. Like, I've started now watermarking <laughs> all my Instagrams. Have you? Just like... It, I, I probably have I, I thousands of Instagrams at this point, and I'm I'm thinking, oh well, all of these are. It's you can kind of see a progression in my Instagramming. At the very beginning, obviously, the phones weren't as beautiful of quality. I mean, the new iPhone six. I don't know if you're an iPhone user, but yeah, the iPhone six takes beautiful photos. So it really the, does, yeah. So did the iPhone five. So did the iPhone four. But you know, the quality has gone up. And it, at the beginning with Instagram, it was more about the filters. And using all those different filters on it. And now I don't use that because the iPhone has given you the ability to edit within natively within the app. Yeah, the cell phone pictures were so bad you kinda had to cover it up with something. You had to. And now it's And now you can actually control the, the Now the pictures look good, so it kinda Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and now it's just a matter of leveling off a little bit or yeah. you know, getting a little vignette or, or whatever it is. Um, adding a little saturation. It's almost like editing a regular photo, not just an Instagram photo. Um who, so we already talked about PF really, but uh, who else has inspired you as a photographer or in your career? Do you look up to particular shooters or anybody? Yeah, I mean, when I was coming up, it was, you know, I was, I was new to it. And I look at people, you know, like Burnett, who has, you know, covered history for, you know, the, some of the biggest news in the world for years and years and years now. He was always a huge inspiration. Mm-hmm. And like somebody like Charles Omni, um, his work to me when I saw Omni's work, it blew me away. It like changed the way I saw photography, you know. And then Christopher Morris too, like they were both covering a lot of White House stuff at the same time. Uh-huh. Did you talk to these guys about their work, or is it just their work is what inspired you? I mean, I I talked to them because I later became friends with them, and you know, it's. But I never was like, oh, you're, you're so inspiring to me. Oh, my God. You, know, you just sort of become peers. And then you just yeah. sort of. Just so, I mean, I've never been that way. I was just if I respect somebody, I just respect them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, but I right now, actually, I gain the most inspiration from my friends, you know, and working with my friends, and uh-huh. like the way they push me and the way they see things. Uh-huh. And that's something that we really started in Iowa. Well, we did it at Brooks a lot. You know, I had a great group of friends there. But in Iowa, you know, that was a place that I really like tried to step up my game a lot based on the people around me because I was in a, you know, I was living in a house with Joshua Lott and Keith Bedford. Right. And, you that know, was Michael in Iowa. Trawanka. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, there were other people who came through too. And, you know, they were all such great photographers that it made me want to be a better photographer because we were out every day shooting together, whether we were on assignment or not. And you just want to be better. You just always want to be better. And you're right. just hungry to be right. better, you know. 
and I still it's still the same for me now you know my friends are the ones who really push me you know more than anything else yeah that's awesome and and what I love about New York and I've really found um, the community here you mentioned Keith Bedford and um, Andrew Gombert um, and you know there are other photographers that have uh, helped out when I was young you know when I first came into the city and you know, would meet for coffee. It used to be kind of like everyone would be out on assignments and we would meet at Starbucks, you know, at certain times and we'd all be filing and you sort of build this community and you look after each other and um, build that network. Uh, and it's been amazing because there, you know, when I was a college student, it's like there are these people I look up to like, oh my gosh, I know these people's names. I know their work. Um, and, you know, they're just human beings on the other end. You know, you kind of see things on TV, you see, or on TV, on the computer, or, or bylines and whatever, and you kind of elevate them, think, oh my gosh, these are these people that are, you know, producing this amazing work, but all you got to do is just network and, uh, and be there. We were poker buddies. Yeah. So that's another thing. A lot, <laughs> yeah. a lot has um, transpired from uh, poker tables. Yeah, that's true. Actually. A lot of networking. That yeah. was one of the things that I did when I was starting up. Um, there was a poker table with like Vince Lafere and, and crew and uh, all sorts of business has come from that. Some people have gotten married um, that were part of the poker table. And yeah, I remember that table. <laughs> it was a good table. <laughs> we kind of have, uh, we, we, we bring it back every so often because Lafere is now in dual coasts at, at this point. Right. And he's got the most room in his, his apartment. So we use his table. Um, but um, I know, like, Lucas has got a, a poker tournament. I actually haven't gone to one of them. I keep everything else. Something always comes up, you know? Yeah. You've been going to those? Yeah, there was one last night, actually. Oh, it was last night. Crap. You see? It's like <laughs> I had date, date night last oh, night. Oh, yeah. That's a good excuse. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah. I mean, it was a, a bunch, of, bunch of photographers, right? Yeah. I mean, good, good turnout? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Lucas has a killer roof deck. I miss that. I'm looking to bring back my old roof deck. Were you ever at my roof deck? Yeah. Yeah, that was epic. Um, okay, so um, let's let's jump into a little bit of uh, we got Boston here, and this is this is uh, anniversary of or, or is, when was this? The, were these photos taken? This was uh, I think the day after. Oh, the, the day bomb. after. I'm sorry. I got yeah. up there. I got a phone call um, about an hour or so after the bombing. Uh-huh. Uh, asking me to go up there, and I was, you know, got up there as soon as I possibly could. Uh-huh. I was probably there four or five hours after the bombing. Something like oh, that. wow, yeah. Um, and so then I spent a couple weeks up there. And there was probably a lot of the same people that you work with there as well. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was kind of a crazy one because nobody knew what was going to happen. It was kind of this story that was constantly changing. right. Especially when that manhunt was going on. Oh man, that was crazy. I I was uh, I was actually in Hawaii, in Maui, doing this road to Hana where you're totally off. Uh, you've been on that. You're totally off the grid, except for occasionally you get a couple text messages through. And all I got was a New York Times, like you know, explosions, Boston, and then a couple friends that you know wrote, "Oh my God, you know, shit's going down." Yeah, it was crazy. And I didn't know what was happening until I until I got back and, yeah. and truly understood. And I think the next day or two, there was the, the manhunt. And that was the day that we were flying home. Oh man. So I was streaming, like I had to wait until I got into the US, you know, continental US, over the continental US. Then we got internet on the plane. And I remember streaming the audio of what was going on. And like, by the time I landed, I think they had like caught him. They had finally caught him. And it was just wild. Like I'm flying in the air. You know, keeping up with this story as it happens, it was yeah, it was crazy. It was just and and so that was a little bit different. You were because you know you didn't know where these things were happening, where Zarnayev got um, caught. Were you there? Like, were you in the vicinity? Did you go to that location? Yeah, and, we were all there. And so, what what did you? You weren't really probably able to get much. It was probably cordoned off at that point. I had the picture of the boat, but oh, he was did. already. They had just pulled him out of it. Or was it? Oh, yeah. okay. So that was your vantage point, huh? Yeah. Right after they got him, I got around to the back side of it and got a picture of the boat. Wow. Wow. But, um, and now that's all kind of right now with the trials happening. Yeah. Have you considered, are you, are you, have you done any more since this? Have you, um, are you considering following up on any of what you've done there? Follow up stories are hard. I mean, you, you kind of have to like, 
No, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of people doing a really good job with that stuff. Yeah. And, and it's hard to go, you know, I don't want to be just another, unless you're really emotionally right. attached to the story. You don't want to be a like, helicopter. Right. Uh, you know, unless you have some sort of like hook into the story or, you know, you like Joplin. When I, when I covered Joplin, I went back to Joplin a few times because I wanted to see how the people that I photographed were doing and how their lives were coming along. And I did some follow up stuff there. Right. But that's because I had this emotional attachment to it. Uh-huh. And you get emotionally attached to a story like this, but not the same way as somebody who was there when the bombing happened and has, you know, goes through the whole year of it. And, you know, there's, like I said, there's people who, who that's their story. Uh-huh. Yeah, totally. Um, now we're going to move into some of your New York singles. Oh, this is, one, this is one of your most famous, too. I keep forgetting, you, you've taken a lot of really great photos. So this is the sort of infamous uh, U.S. Airways flight crash landing into the Hudson River. Yeah. Which I missed. And like, how did you get this vantage point? How did you get there so quickly? What's the deal? How um, did you do this? <laughs> I was in the Reuters office and th- we saw it from the window. We saw the plane in the river. From the- well, I didn't oh, see it. Oh, wow. I was running, but they saw it and sent me to the river. And I got to the river and got onto a rescue boat, one of the ferries that was going out with firefighters. And so just happened to get really lucky. Just really lucky. Were you one of the only people on that boat? Just, just getting there. It's, it's sometimes, you know, covering breaking news. For instance, I covered the the big fire that happened recently. I don't know if you were in town for that. There was a huge fire. Oh, down that this. explosion that happened. Big explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Four buildings went down and everything. Yeah, and I just California happened to be a block away from it. So, you know, I was able to get some shots and get a vantage point and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. I couldn't believe that, you know, as close as I was, the access that I didn't get because they were already pushing people back what other photographers were able to do because they came from different angles. You know, one person, um, John Taggart, I think it was, came from like Times Square. Mm -hmm. So he came from uptown and he was right in it, like with them putting out the fire on the street right in front of the whole thing. And I'm like, how did you get, how did you get in there? That's Taggart. I mean, he goes, Taggart goes hardcore. He does. He goes in and he's, you know, he gets in there when he needs to get in I've never worked with him. He's great. He's a good Um, friend of mine. But, uh, yeah, we got to get him on the podcast. I yeah, want to talk he, to him about yeah, all sorts of on, stuff. Yeah. Um, so, oh, sorry, we were going through. So these are all New York singles. Yeah, um, it's just stuff, stuff and, over the years. That, so what would you say your style, and I think, I think we're, we kind of similarly look at uh, light mm-hmm. the same way. Uh, we, you know, I'm, I'm drawn to light uh, and, uh, you know, beautiful, contrasty light and mm-hmm. also shooting wide open. <laughs> I think you do too, I'm, I'm just assuming based off some of these photos. Um, do you, like, so So most of these photos I'm imagining are on assignment, or are these just sort of, sort of random? Yeah, most of the stuff is done on assignment. How much do you do not on assignment, like, of your own personal work? God, I used to shoot so much more not on assignment, and, and I feel like now I'm trying to get back, you know. Nobody's carrying around the mirrorless cameras now. And yeah. I bought one of those, and... I don't know. Did this plane trash. plane went through the. Yeah, that was on the ten year anniversary. That is ridiculous. I mean, really, <laughs> like I mean, just I mean, that's a split second. Were you, did you have did you see it lining up, or were you just like, oh my god, what was that? Well, the funny part was, that, you know, this is the night before. This is the Sept- the ten year September eleventh anniversary. Uh huh. And the night before, they turned on the lights for an hour as a test. Uh huh. And so everybody was out there, like all the best photographers in the world had come here to cover the story. And so I like, I show up and I like, they had given me a vantage point, you know, the client I was shooting for and I was running around and like 45 minutes into this night, I I still don't have a picture. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I like, I'm out here and I'm like blowing it. I'm sure all these guys have gotten these great pictures. Right. And I like look up and I'm on the West side highway and I look up and I see this plane and it like starts going for the lights and I'm like, no, no way. This yeah. is not going to happen. There's no way they would do that. <laughs> uh-huh. And so I got my camera up and I got three frames off and this was the only one in focus. It's actually in focus. It doesn't look in focus. <laughs> it, yeah. Yeah. Um, but I only got three frames in focus. I mean, three frames, one in focus. And this was the one that I got in focus. And I was like, oh, everybody got the shot because it happened. Right. It happened. Everybody's out there. Well, and plus your angle, though, might be completely different from someone that's, say, on Broadway or, or you know, by the by the towers. Again, um, total luck. You know that pilot has got to be thinking, 
look at this. Like, <laughs> I'm going to aim right for this, you know, yeah. just to go through that beam. I mean, how could you miss that? It can't just happen to be on the, on the flight path going through that beam. Anyway, that's an incredible photo. And working with uh, Christy, mm -hmm. what do you think about him? He's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Seems like a fun guy to be around. Yeah. I mean, all these politicians are great. They're yeah. all really easy to work with. And they, they're people. Yeah. Person, I mean, pe yeah, people persons. They wouldn't have made it to where they are unless they were good with people. So. Right. And then shooting at the, this is the UN. Yeah. The UN is a, a tough building to shoot in. It is. <laughs> and that is a beautiful photo. Thanks. Reflections and everything. And all, it gives the sense of like no one attended his, uh, <laughs> his speech too. That guy was big time for a minute. Yeah. He, he was. Um, Akhmedimit. Ahmadinejad. 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 That's what it is. Um, and then Hurricane Sandy came came along, which I totally missed. I was in Ohio covering the election. Oh, okay, yeah. So I completely missed Hurricane Sandy. Yeah, it sounded like it was tough to get around though. So I, I, you know, when I for Hurricane Sandy, I um, ended up not really covering it, covering it, but for I went out on my front stoop because I just wanted to see what it was like. And I have I live on a tree on the uh, on a street on the Upper West Side with big trees kind of canopying over, and the trees were just swaying back and forth like I've never seen before. It was you know wild. So I, I went out to my friend's stoop and I thought, oh God, I got to take some pictures. And I looked down the street and I see that there was a tree down all the way at the end of the street. So I ended up going to check it out. I went to my motor. I have like a little scooter and I have a motorcycle helmet. I put on just that's my safety. Went down the street, started taking pictures of the tree that fell down. And Did then, anybody get pictures of this? Because this would have been kind of I hope not. <laughs> but uh, then I hear a noise, and I look back down the street towards my apartment, you know, and I, I don't see the street lights anymore. And so I run back, and the tree right across from my apartment door, from across the street, fell, boom, right onto the steps where I was standing, just Jeez. watching. So had I not left, I would have had a tree fall on me. Um, and you know, it's, it's kind of crazy how, and then a, a cab ran into the, the tree and it was just a, a mess. So I took some video, took some pictures and even met a couple of my neighbors who came out to see what the hell was going on. Yeah. And, um, you know, even business came out of that, you know, one of them was a lawyer that's helped me out on some, some projects and stuff like that. It's just the yes. randomest of events here in New York city, anywhere really, yeah. but here in New York, especially, you know, hurricane Sandy led to this instance that put me in the right place to meet this this person so and you kind of have to be that way as a as a freelancer you gotta definitely yeah, you gotta always take, be looking take, for yeah and then fashion week i i did some work for reuters back in the day a long time ago and that was one of the first things i did for reuters a lot of fashion how do you like fashion work it's kind of it's good it's a tough week to cover but it's, you usually you know, cover the whole week huh Sometimes I I'll do it every like third like time now or right. something. I don't I don't do it every year. It's like difficult because at the end at the end of the runway you've got these little squares that all the photographers are squeezed into. Yeah. And it's just I've got one time I got a cramp, and I'm like oh my god like a Charlie horse <laughs> in my hamstring and I got to stand up and I'm like I got to hold it you know for 30 more seconds before I can jump up because everyone's gonna kill me if I jump up right in front of them during the show. Um, covering sports and I think you're like me with sports too like I used to cover sports all the time but now I like covering it as a feature yeah I, I only shot sports like when I worked for the local newspaper in Ventura you know as a as a stringer and Right. I don't really shoot much sports anymore, unless it's like, like you said, like sports features. Well, what is your what is what is your like um, passion? Like, what is it you're passionate about covering? Like, uh, you know, perfect. What's the perfect assignment for for you? Or where do you where do you want to? If you could choose how your career path would go, if money wasn't an option, <laughs> or not a, not an option, but wasn't an issue, hmm. where where what direction would you go? It's a good question. I've been like, kind of pondering that now. You know, because I've kind of hit a point where I don't really know. There's a lot of roads in front of me, and I don't really know which one to take next. You know, whether that's go commercial or whether to keep pushing for, you know, try to get a staff job with a wire service or, a, you know. I don't know. I'm, you know, that's kind of where I'm, it's kind of where I'm at now. I'm kind of trying to figure out. This is that transitional period at this yeah. point. Um, I love covering big news. I love it. I mean, I love, there's something so amazing about hearing about something and then being in the middle of the middle of that. Right. You know, and you can't see around you because as far as like, you know, what the story is becoming because you're in the story and you're in the middle of it. Uh-huh. And I love that. Uh-huh. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, there's the coming from a small town, Athens, Ohio is where I grew up. You know, a lot of people don't, 
they see everything on the news. You know, it's they, they living here in New York and having the type of job that we have is kind of just it's just out of the realm of, of reality mm-hmm. for people. You know, that they only consume this stuff through whatever devices, you know. Um, yeah. So, so let's let's move over to um, uh, Iowa here. So this is uh, this was with the presidential election. This was the first time around in 2007, 2008 when we had the House in Des Moines. And so you so you I should also mention that during this time, you you and Keith and those fellas created a blog. We did, yeah. And it, and it is is it still there? Or? I think it's still there. Yeah. It's called the st- the stumping grounds. Yeah, we did another one in in 2012 too. Uh-huh. The guys, you know, we were there with that time because Joshua came back and right with some new guys. Like and Bert's it became and pretty popular. Yeah. I mean, like uh, people seem to like it. And I mean, it's kind of interesting because you know the political realm that there, there's insiders and they they keep up on on the news. And when there's a, a really great news source, whether it's a blog or not. Um, you know, it's really, really well. I think it, I think I just remember it getting a lot of, you know, press and seeing regular updates. And, and, the, and the concept was that every day there'd be basically a photo a day, right? Yeah, I mean, that was what was funny about it is that... She's so approachable. Yeah, yeah she's great. <laughs> she actually is great. Yeah. I like her a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah, we, it started out as this thing that, like, Every day, whoever had the best photo that we would all decide on would make it onto the blog. Uh-huh. And so it became this, like, you know, little mini friendly company. competition yeah. between all of us. I think that's great. It's fun. Yeah. It made us all shoot a lot better. It made us I bet. Better and now what's interesting is, like, there's, there's now, that was before Instagram. Yeah. So Instagram's kind of changed a little bit how people blog and get their information, their instant information out mm-hmm. there. I mean, there was Facebook back then, and yeah, you could post photos onto it and everything, but uh, not really as instantaneously and, and to such a wide audience um, as you do now. <laughs> this is a hilarious photo. <laughs> I love it. I mean, that's 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 the thing about shooting politics is that you it's the same thing every time for the most part, and then figuring out what those interesting angles are and getting away from right trying to get away from the uh, the pack is that yeah. what you do do you try to like see okay everyone's over there i'm going to get over here yeah but then everybody goes over there and you know now it's like everybody's everybody's so good at photography i mean you know on these things and you know you you're on the campaign trail and you look and you you think you see the, something different and there's already two guys over there you know like when you make it to that level some of these guys, you know, they're everyone sort of so sees good. and knows yeah. and kind of. So really, there is no pack when it get, when it comes to like you know, being at that elite level of you know, anything I guess. Right. But, but with, you know, certainly photography. Right. What's your what, when you're shooting uh, an event or not an event, but like say the this poli- pol- political campaign or or whatever? You're usually shooting. Well, no, because you said you were shooting for the New York Times as well. But if, you know, what is the the most gratifying part of that is that getting a front page is it you know you know what I mean like what what is it that makes you like really crave to do this type of work and and you know what's the payoff at the end would you say I don't know I mean I guess that's changed over the years like you know before it was all what motivated me was you know having the best picture of that day Uh uh-huh and whatever that event was having you know knowing that I got the best picture uh-huh. And knowing that you know my picture was better than everybody else's, even if they were my friends, they wanted the same thing. I know they did, mm-hmm. but I know that that day I won. Uh-huh. And now I don't know if that really motivates me as much, you know, because it's Cause tomorrow's I'm the next to, day. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, because you you do that enough, and it's you know, some days you're gonna have the best picture, and some days your best friend's gonna have the best picture. Right. You know, and you can't let that drive you too far, you know, because then competition sort of takes over you know right so i don't know i guess just the opportunity to keep doing what i'm doing and with my friends you know that's the best part of it is being able to be out there with my best friends and do this job what about nowadays with likes oh i don't care about likes i mean you care about likes of course because you know we're all a little bit vain (laughs) but we all have a little bit of an ego or bigger egos or whatever some have bigger than others that's yeah we're you know we're all in a performance-based industry so of course everybody's going to have, a, you know, at least a little bit of an ego. Right. And is going to care about that stuff at least a little bit. But I try not to care that much about it. Right. You know. 
So covering this election with Obama. <laughs> These two did not like each other very much. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're friends now, right? They are. Um, what was, you know, could you tell covering Obama back then? It was, you know, Obama and Hillary, Democratic race at this point. But did you, like, you see him come in, you're like, holy cow. Like, at that point, was it like kind of like obvious to you that this is this is a guy to... Yeah, I mean, the charisma that he had and has still is, I mean, it's, you know, there, there are people, generations, that, you know, that one person out of that generation or two or three people out of that generation have this, like, amazing charisma, and he was, you know, he was one of those people. Right. He um, was one of those people. Yeah, is, right. Do you have the, uh, the like, the politics, I mean, you really have done a, an amazing job covering politics. Uh, do you, would you ever foresee, could you foresee yourself doing a, a job like full time in politics? Say, say so and so Senator runs and you could get a job photographing him as a president or something like that. Is that something that, that you would want to do? Or is that, I don't know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's a pretty David wild Hume life. David Kennerly, like is, yeah. he had an amazing career as, you know, as a White House photographer. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the amazing, it's kind of like a sacrifice, though. It, it's like, a, you know, a totally abnormal life that you that you live. And, you know, I talked to Pete about it a bit. Um, I can imagine. I can imagine. He's just on the road going constantly. Obama's, you know. Everywhere. He's everywhere motivated. Obama goes. Yeah, he's he he works hard. And you and you have to know everybody and know the the, the proper tact of getting into situations. Mm -hmm. And um yeah, I mean, I've always thought how, how cool of a job that would be. But at the same time, I wonder how, you know, my other my life would sacrifice by doing that, you know, having to be on and ready for and basically committing four to eight years of your life to one. I mean, we're freelancers for the last right. 10 years. We've been doing a different thing every day and we've been completely in control of our schedule. Right. Yeah. Do you, I mean, other than a, a really great job like that, do you ever foresee yourself becoming a staffer? Yeah, I mean, if it was the right job, I'd love to, to be, be a right staffer, thing. you know? Here, here, you see yourself in New York? Do you see yourself somewhere else? I don't really know. I've been also trying to think that. Like, I miss the West Coast a lot. I do. I like it out there. It's mm -hmm. pretty great out there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, overseas would be cool, too. Or Yeah. Even New York, you know, as long as you got to travel out of here a lot. Yeah. New York's kind of a grind. It really is. It's... So, so what else? Uh, so beyond f photography, like we all do our assignment works. I mean, I, I kind of feel like you and I are kind of in a similar place where it's like we could we can do what we've been doing for the past 10 years for the next 10 years. And, and but is there like that segue you were talking about? Do you think that maybe you might want to get into more speaking gigs? You mentioned that you did a speaking gig for ASMP. Yeah, they were great. And uh, how was that? I mean, how is speak like I know that you did a speaking gig for us as well here at, at uh, what do you call it, um, Adorama? What do you call it? We're at Adorama, everyone. I don't know. I don't. I don't talk a lot. So yeah, know, I'm me, trying to like get you to talk <laughs> more. Yeah, yeah. You. I mean, for me, spe I mean, I can do it, but I don't know. I just want to keep shooting. Yeah, yeah. Just keep shooting. I mean, that's the goal. Keep yeah. on, keep and on keep, doing your thing. You know. Um. Cool. I don't know what that's going to be yet. I don't know in what capacity. Like I said, that's what I'm trying to, I'm trying to navigate that right now. You know. Right. I think one of the things about being a, a photojournalist, though, is that you know, I think sometimes we forget that we do this, you know, and we're in these all these situations, but like it's not us. We're there as observers. You right. Know? And so I think it's really easy sometimes to lose your own life and to lose who you are and like get so wrapped up in this other shit you're doing. That you sort of forget to live your own life, you know, right. and it becomes this escape because you're in the middle of the craziest and coolest and like uh, the biggest news, you know. Yeah. But it's not you. It's not it's not your life. You know, it's somebody else's. Yeah. And so I think sometimes it's important. And, you know, for me, that's what I'm trying to focus on, too, is like trying to have something, you know, outside of that or at least or at least be aware of that and try to, you know, yeah, live your life sometimes without a camera or without. Yeah. Or just doing something else. Yeah. Figuring out different sources of revenue as well is important. Um, yeah, I mean, this is just, it's its what we do. It's not who we are. It, you know, it doesn't define us. It's, it's great. You know, it's our job, but it's just our job. Yeah. I want to, I'd love to talk with you because I have so many friends that I, I just respect so much. And 
you know, I'd really love to, to get a really great group of people together. You know, I'm doing this. I had mentioned earlier about this, um, what I've got going on in Maui. And I'm, I'm going to be doing a workshop with uh, uh, my pal, Peter Lockley, uh, who I also met. He was at, I, don't, I know you don't know him very well, but he was a student at Eddie Adams' workshop also. And that's how I met him. Nice. Just goes to show, well, I want to talk to you a little more about Eddie Adams as well. But it goes to show that, you know, you can make these connections that are last a lifetime, whether it's just friendships or business or, or whatever. So together, you know, this past year, we put together a pitch to, you know, the Four Seasons in, in Maui. And, and um, we're doing a workshop um, in June. And it's sort of a proof of concept. But, but we're, you know, it's going to be at a luxury Four Seasons. And, and uh, it's going to be a, a really amazing time. Um, but something like this, you know, I could imagine getting all sorts of, you know, my friends and colleagues together and, and doing these types of workshops all over the place. Because I know you and I have uh, worked together on, let's see here, I want to pull it up, Eddie Adams Workshop dot com. Um, oh, can't find the server. Let's see here. Eddie Adams, A-D, oh, no A, there it is. So you and I have worked on the Eddie Adams workshop and gone to the Eddie Adams workshop together. Oh my gosh. Is it yayworkshop.com? K-S-H-O-P.com. Or maybe I just don't have internet. Here it comes. There it is. Um, and I don't know if you were a producer last year. You were a producer with me last year. Were you, had you been a producer previously? Yeah, the year before that. The year before that. Yeah. And, and it's... Like what? What is your thoughts on on Eddie Adams? Like, how important has that or this this workshop been to you in your career? I mean, it's been amazing. I mean, you know, it was another one of the reasons that I moved to New York because I, I you know, came to the workshop when we were students and like just got, just totally humbled. But it also made me want to be better. It also made me want to you know work a lot harder and put myself in an, in a you know, in a, in a sphere of where these people were. Right. Know? So, so the, the, for people that don't know, basically Eddie Adams was this amazing Vietnam shooter, um, back in the day. And he built a workshop in a barn in upstate New York. Anybody that's interested can listen to a previous podcast I did with Alyssa Adams, his, his late wife. I mean, no, I'm sorry. That was said wrong. He, uh, Eddie has passed away. <laughs> his, his, uh, at Alyssa Adams, his wife, uh, came on the show recently, and we talked all about um, the workshop. And, you know, there's it's the 100 top students and early professionals is what it is every year. They've been doing this now for almost 30 years, so nearly 3,000 early professional students, some of the best, the creme de la creme of young students being taught by yeah. the best of the best um, professionals in the field um, every year. So you and I have been a, a producer. In fact, we were bunk mates. Yeah, <laughs> and um, which was which was amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, so I just think it's really important for for young folks to know, uh, and anybody who wants to get into this world, it's all about networking. It's all about getting in into the business and and uh, meeting the people. And and this is a great way. They've just uh, applications are actually now open. Uh, starting, I think, just a few days ago. So if you go to eddieadamsworkshop.com, uh, you can apply. Uh, and it's actually free. It's completely free, you know, sponsored workshop, and it's really great. So everybody go check that out. Um, so anything else that, like, any any new projects coming up, or anything that uh, we should pitch, talk about? I don't know. No, I mean... Are you, are you in New York for a while? Are you going anywhere? For a little while, I'll probably start doing some early election stuff soon early election and, stuff getting out back to iowa and stuff yeah, like that just kind of you know figuring out what i'm gonna do for that what does what if somebody wants to do something like that like you do at the you know i'm not it's, they should just do it i mean it's just, it's an just easy go out and do it Iowa's a great place to get started it's a great place to go out and you know kind of make a name access, for yourself the access is so easy there to candidates and it really really tightens up later in the you know in the campaign right so, right. Yeah, I mean, I would always recommend people go to Iowa and yeah, try to make it work. Cool. 
Well, awesome. I, I think that we can sort of close this up. Uh, you know, before we do, I just want to give a couple quick shouts again to um, National Press Photographers Association, great organization, along with uh, ASMP. Uh, that help you both in, in the copyright realm as well as the First Amendment rights. Um, they both kind of do both, but ASMP is more about, uh, you know, copyright and business, and National Press Photographers Association is about uh, protecting First Amendment rights. So, for instance, becoming a member, uh, if you were to get arrested, say, in Ferguson, like um, Scott Olson did, mm -hmm. you know, first, your first call is Mickey Osterreicher, the, the lawyer at, uh, yeah, he was NBA. there on the ground with us. He was actually. there on the ground. So yeah. they, they provide support and there is a, a fee for these services, but right. you can very easily and quickly, um, you know, utilize that, that fee, you know, just yeah, one definitely. conversation with Mickey, who's the lawyer, you know, pays for it. And he's helped me in many ways. And even, you know, member or non-member, he was there to help out whoever was, you know, getting arrested or getting hassled or anything he was it didn't matter if you were you know mppa or not and i thought that was telling of right you know right the importance of that yep so check it out mppa.org asmp.org i believe as well and then um also just so you know actually this is actually streaming live i think but you can go to our website photobrigade.com slash live where you can see all our previous events um it's loading. We got slow, slow internet here because we're streaming our, our, our thing. As you can see, we've got this up right now. Um, you can see our previous events, our live events, and our upcoming events. So um, I think, Eric, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, awesome. Your, your social media is just Eric Thayer, right? Yeah, all the way around. All the way around, Eric Thayer. All right. Eric, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thanks for having me. All right. Cheers, everyone. Thank you.